Ecology. Okay, this meeting has been recorded. <laughs> so then I studied biology, and then after my twelfth, I decided to do a bachelor's in biology to uh, get more into the subject. And it was during that time when we had many subjects in biology, from anatomy uh, to evolution to cellular uh, and molecular biology, that I got interested in the nervous system. and so i i searched on the internet where can i study further about the about the brain and uh, in that year which was 2013 iit gandhinagar started the program of cognitive science and i found out that one of the components of the program is studying neuroscience so i took that up and then after that i did my phd in neuroscience and now i'm doing research in neuroscience uh, so my fascination with brain uh, has been actually i would say uh, around the same age as uh, as you guys so i'm very very happy to see that you're here and today in the uh, in the presentation i will give you a basic brief uh, introduction of what the brain is a uh, a uh, human brain so our brain how does it look like uh, what kind of things uh, it does and <clears throat> i will show you cases where sometimes it can trick you into seeing things differently but before we start i want to ask you something a uh, uh, very basic a very basic question which will maybe make you start thinking why brain is important so when you say i that i did something or i will do something uh, i want this i was this who is this i uh, have you ever thought of this when you say i who are you referring to where is this i can you can you put it yes ourselves so who created this idea of i in your head the brain yes yes so it's our brain uh, our brain is enabling us to think our brain is enabling us to know who we are in the context of the environment where we are in so everything that we will do will be in the relationship between us which is the brain uh, which is in the body that you are and the environment so now with that note we will start uh, the lecture i will open the presentation and if you think that uh, i am very fast you can stop me at any point i will slow down a bit and for questions in between i will stop to ask you if there are questions uh, but you can also type in the chat and we will take and siddharth will maybe stop me if there are a lot of questions pressing questions we will stop there uh, to take that up so i'm just going to share the presentation now okay so can you see the presentation Yes, we can see it clearly. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah. now that I have shared the screen, I don't see you. So if you have anything, just unmute. If there's something that you really, really want to ask, uh, don't hesitate. You can also put it in the chat. But yes, just uh, say it because I don't see people anymore. I just see the presentation screen. So today, as I said, we will just uh, take a brief look. Uh, of a human brain and basically highlight some of the things that we will later be covering in the summer class if you uh, come there so first of all uh, how does it look like so i will first show you some cartoon representation of the brain so this is a diagram of the brain if you look from the top so if somebody is on the top of my head and they open the skull this is the view that they see so these are two hemispheres of your brain uh one on the left and one on the right side they are actually connected uh by some tissue in between but if you look from the top they actually look like two different it's basically like a walnut uh you must have had walnuts right when you take out the shell what you see is actually how the walnuts are good for our brain yeah yes they are <laughs> they are good for brain yes and they resemble very much like how uh the human brain is now if you have to see the brain inside the skull of a human being let's see this is a human being looking on the uh, uh, right side and these are structures that are shown after having a section so here the picture is not very uh, maybe zoomed in for you but they have uh, highlighted some of the areas of the brain which are important but these are really deep seated you can't see it from above but if you do a slice of brain like this uh, uh, vertically you will see some structures which are inside which are very very important uh and when we come to the class later in summer we will talk more about this 
and we are also seeing if we have an opportunity with the hospital at Manipal to go see real human brain. If if they have that facility, we would like to take the kids to see the actual human brain in the in the hospital. And then you will have more understanding. At least you can visualize better what we are talking about in the class. Now this is actually a real brain which has been dissected. So it has been cut. So here, if you see, if I cut here exactly in the middle and separate the two hemispheres, this is what I will see inside the brain. You see a lot of folded tissue. This is cortex on the top. Then here you, you can identify some structures which are very, very critical. Here at the bottom is a structure very important for movement coordination and then brain stem uh, and other structures. But it looks very similar. Actually, when you look here, you can't say which part is which. It's not very distinct. The color is very much the same. Uh, in, in the real body, it's, it's all going to be red because you have blood vessels going in the brain uh, to take oxygen to the brain. It will be actually very, very red. But this is somebody's brain which has been removed after the person uh, was brain dead. And then it has been dissected for studying purposes. So you see now there is no uh, red a color here the blood vessels have uh, all died and the blood has been removed but all you see is the neural tissue now of course we we mostly study human brain uh, in uh, when people are alive and for that what we do is that we scan the human uh, brain uh, this is the scanning with the mri you can see that uh, here we have put some color to highlight but in the Scanning, everything is black and white uh, in the normal uh, scanning. On the top, as I told you, is the folded tissue. It is cerebral. It does everything. Uh, a, a lot of things that you can think of that you do are actually coming from this tissue on the top. And here you have the cerebellum, which is important for coordination of movements. And this is the brain stem, which takes care of vital things like breathing, uh, uh, maintaining your heartbeat and things like that. Uh, so these structures are also in a lot of other animals. How humans differ from other animals is this. They have this very highly developed uh, cerebral hemisphere, the green part that you see in the picture. Now, brain is not the only thing, of course, in the in our uh, it's not working in a stand alone manner. Uh, it is connected uh, to other parts via nerves. And it sends nerves to all the body parts. Uh, uh, and it is done via the spinal cord. So here, if you take out the nervous system uh, and put it on the display here, this is how it's going to look like. You have the brain on the top. And then you have the brain stem, which is actually underneath. You can't very well see from this view, but it's underneath the, uh, the brain, the cerebral here. Then you have the spinal cord, which is going to run all the way from your neck uh, down to the to your back at the end of your back and then it's going to send projections to other parts of the body uh, these are nerves that go and innervate every muscle of your body uh, and that's how the brain will send information to different body parts yes i have a question yes uh, i learned that uh, i've learned that the brain can sends like gray matter and white matter what's the function of that uh, yes, so in the uh, in the neural tissue, you have when you stain it after removing the removing it from a real uh, human being, you will see some dark part and some light part. So the dark part is called uh, gray matter, and the white part is called white matter. The when we will talk about neurons, uh, which we will skip in this class actually, but the brain and the nervous systems, the fundamental unit is the, a neuron. So when you do that uh, staining, what you see the, the in the gray part, you have the cell body of the neuron. And that's why it looks gray. And then in the white, you have the axons uh, mostly running. So it looks white when you, when you do that staining. It's because of how the neurons, uh, different parts are arranged in the neural tissue. Uh, and they do different things. Uh, the cell body of the neuron is, is known to have some different uh, role in processing information, whereas the axon has different role in processing information. So sometimes in disease condition, you can you may hear that, OK, in this disease, the gray matter is reduced or the white matter is reduced. That just refers to the amount of uh, what happens to the cell body and the axon in certain disease conditions. Ma yes? Ma'am, I have a doubt, ma'am. 
Yes. So, ma'am, if we, uh, why the, does the brain send the signals through the spinal cord, ma'am? Why can't it not send it directly through the nerves? Uh, so, actually, the spinal cord is a, bun is a bunch of nerves. So, you can think of it like, let's say you want to garden, you want to water in your garden, right? And you have plants which are spread all over your garden. You will have a main water pipeline, right? which will first go in, run in the center. And then from that main pipeline, you can have small pipes coming out to give water to the periphery. Because human body is so big and just one nerve cannot go everywhere. So what the brain does first, it, it the output of the brain is first in a collection of uh, neurons, which is the spi spinal cord. Actually inside the spinal cord, you have this bunch running. And then out of that, the nerves will branch out. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so then we will continue. So I'm back to the presentation. Uh, I hope you see it. Okay, yeah, so as I said, we will cover this more in depth in the class and we will talk about these, the smaller units of the nervous system, which is this axons that are very, very crucial in information, uh, uh, receiving, processing, and then transmitting it. Now, just to give you some interesting facts about the human brain, uh, we know that it's only 2% of your body weight. So as somebody said, actually, in the beginning, uh, some student, that it's, it's a small part of the body, but what it does is tremendously important. Uh, and people have estimated that it uses about 20% of your energy and oxygen supply. Uh, and it has a lot of water in it. You know that because the blood is going there for, uh, uh, for taking the nutrients and the oxygen. So it's mostly water. And if you're not hydrated, it can affect a lot of brain function. So we know from a lot of studies that if people are not well hydrated, it can have a effect on their attention, on their memories, and other functions that the brain does. So staying hydrated is not just important for your body, it is very, very crucial for your brain. Uh, and we know after scanning people from different age group and uh, other categories that the size can vary. We, what we do not know is that how it affects brain functions. We don't know how if there is a direct link between the size of your brain and how well you do some tasks. What we know is that the brain size can vary across different age groups without having actually much implication on, on the brain function. And one thing which is very, very interesting that you have about 86 billion neurons. Some people say about 100 billion. So it's you can take it as a rough estimate, which is interestingly the same as the number of galaxies that we have been able to count in the observable universe. So actually, you can say that in your skull, you're carrying a little universe which has so many neurons. And this is just neurons. There are other cells in the brain as well. But here we are just talking about neurons, which are the uh, main unit which process information in the brain. And there are a lot of them in your brain. Uh, and we will go mo more into depth in the class later. Now, this was just a brief introduction about the structure of the brain, how it looks like, some interesting things. Now, can you tell me what does the brain do? What does your brain do? Have you thought of it? The brain. Um, yes. It, all, what does it, it, can, it first controls the body. You, ne you need to first um, use your brain instead of doing things uh, immediately after it. That's what they say. Yes. Very good. Anybody else? It gives instructions to other body parts. Okay, yes, very good. The brain uh, controls what you think. Yes, very good. So you're thinking. I feel like it, brain? Feel like it dict yeah, dictates the functions of the human body. Yes, exactly. The so brain is the main source of the human body. Like without it, can't survive. Yes, without it, you won't be human actually. Because what makes you human is is basically your brain and what you can do with it. Uh, so everything that you are saying and much more is what the brain does. Everything that you can think of that you do is actually uh, the the starting point is the brain. Brain is involved in it. Uh, uh, you cannot do it without having the brain. 
Now, is there anything that you can think which you feel uh, the brain may not be involved in? Maybe you don't need your brain for that. No, well, those are called involuntary movements, but our brain has full of use. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, there are I can't some think. movements known as involuntary movements, like such as your breathing rate and heartbeat, but even in those movements, our, our brain is being still in use. Yes, exactly. So even there was, an, there was this idea for a very long time that you do some involuntary movement. Maybe you do not need your brain for that. But now we know that's not true. Your involuntary functions are also controlled by your brain. It's just that you are not aware. So you can, let's say right now I'm pressing the keys on my computer. I know it. I can control it. But there are some things which I cannot control, but it's happening, like breathing. My breathing rate is automatically modulated. But my brain is doing that. So even if it is involuntary, my brain is involved. So you're right. Actually, everything uh, our brain is doing, it's right. As of now, we don't think there is anything that the brain is not involved in, in terms of what human activities uh, are like. And just to give you a broad idea of how different parts are involved in different functions, uh, this was a very dominant idea in neuroscience. Now, slightly with new research, this view is changing. What we are now saying is that a function, let's say movement that you do, can be uh, a result of a lot of brain regions interacting with each other. So yes, there will be one dominant area which is crucial for movement or giving the motor output to your body parts, but it's a result of a lot of interactions that is happening between other parts of the brain. Okay, But uh, just for simplification, you can see that you have these top uh, cerebrum and you can see a lot of things happen so for example the frontal lobe is mostly involved in olfaction or control of your lot of decisions a lot of decision making actually happens in the frontal lobe then you have here uh, slightly on the uh, on the left and also on the right side you will have what is known as Broca's areas which is what is responsible for producing speech uh, then you have you go to the so here is the central sulcus, which, which is sort of dividing the brain in the front and back. In Just in front of the central sulcus, we have a very important structure, which is called motor cortex. And this is actually what I study for my research. If you have a stroke in this area, you, you will have very difficulty making movements. So this is very important for making movements. Just behind this central sulcus line is your sensory cortex, which is taking in information related from your, all your sensory organs. Uh, then behind that is the parietal lobe, which is involved in a lot of function, uh, including understanding language and also understanding space around you. So uh, understanding how your body is positioned in the environment around you. So spatial uh, coordination related things. Temporal lobe on the side, which are actually right above your ear. They are important for hearing. At the back, we know is the occipital lobe, which is involved in processing visual information. And then here is cerebellum, which you saw in the cross section that I showed before. It is very important in coordinating movements. Then you have the brain stem, which is actually taking care of a lot of involuntary uh, functions that the body does. Now, as I said, what your brain is doing which is encased in your body is helping you interact with the world. So just, just imagine that you are one entity placed in the environment. Now, how do you interact with the environment? So let's say you are placed around this building. You see a lot of people. You want to process their information. All the information, sensory information that you can extract from this uh, environment will be sent to your So it's a building. I see some people. There is this person posing for a photo and there are three people taking photograph of that person. So all this information you will extract, it's very, very fast. And this is called sensory information that will go to your, that will be sent to your brain via different senses. So you can have your vision. If you are touching something, you will have touch related information. If somebody's talking, you will hear the sound which will go to your brain. And then your brain may act so you can go close to check what is happening. You can talk back to people around you. You can move. And so the brain will send output so that you can act in the environment that you are placed in. So it's like a loop. Uh, you take in information from the environment and then you act towards the environment. Uh, and this is how your behavior is guided. 
and uh, the brain is and the brain basically along with the nervous system so all the nerves that are innervating your body is allowing you to know the world and to engage with it now the question comes how accurate is your brain in knowing the outer world so you may think the okay wherever i am placed my brain is probably doing the best information processing to give me the information about the outer world uh, sometimes this is not uh, actually accurate and therefore a lot of people say that uh, your understanding of the environment let's say we are both in one room uh, my understanding or my uh, sensory information processing of that environment may vary from yours because of how our brain is processing information and just to give you a quick example of how this may happen uh, i will ask you to see something on your screen so please pay attention uh, make sure that you are a bit closer to the screen and i will show you some examples where uh, there is something external as a stimuli so let's say there's something in the external world but your brain is actually not giving you the right information okay so let's start are you ready are there like uh, illusions are there like optical illusions yes yes are you ready for it yeah okay so can you tell me how many triangles are there in this image two actually yeah two No. Okay, take your take your time. Take your there's, time. There's six. Um, okay. Seven. Five. Okay. Actually, only one. One. Okay. okay. Eight. I guess there's eight. Okay, eight. Yes. I'll, okay. Ma'am, technically they're only zero, but the brain shows a different thing. Yes, yes, exactly. So there is no triangle in this image. So what your brain is doing that it is filling up. It's creating a line actually. So what you have are these pacmen. So you have these three pacmen with open mouth. You can say, and then you have these lines here. That's it. But your brain is supposed. To, what it does is that it has some idea of how the environment should look like, and so it is filling in the gap, which is not even there in the in the image. and it is making me feel that okay maybe there is this white triangle and then there is a black triangle probably behind it and then some people are saying eight because they are thinking okay this small one is also a triangle so then you have the two big triangles and then you have the six small triangles but in reality there is no triangle in this image it's just how these images are arranged that your brain is filling in the information which is not there and it it has learned in its life course that okay some sometimes uh, lines are all why it is happening because we know that if there is something which is starting from one end and it is also from the other end they must be connecting somewhere so it must be in the background of this white triangle so there's a white triangle on the top and there's a black triangle which is intervened by this white triangle in the background but you yes. see the information yes uh, what part of your brain is uh... So actually, for these kind of illusions, you have many areas which are interacting. Here, what plays a critical uh, role is your prior information about the world. So in in our brain, from a young age uh, until later in our adulthood, we create model of the world. Uh, which we don't know where exactly it resides there are many areas which people think where this model of the world resides so you take in information from the from the environment in this case the information is visual so you will have lot of activity in your visual area and then you will take information from previous experiences and then you will try to combine that information that you know about the world with what you are seeing right now and then you will draw a conclusion so no. many areas of the brain will be involved yes but it's it's a it's an example of visual illusion yes because you think you are seeing something but it's also because of how you think the world should be like which is a prior information about the world like visual cortex yes uh, yes and then somebody else had a question yes ma'am um uh, yes. ma'am uh, okay ma'am is this is a general doubt ma'am yes so ma'am why are we learning this ma'am how is it useful in our uh, in our future ma'am Ah yes very good questions because see uh, once you start to realize that you the information that you take in may not be accurate you will become more aware of it right let's say i have a machine i don't know if it is uh, 
I'm just using it every day without knowing whether it is uh, taking whether it is doing the processing of information correctly or not. Then it may, the output that it will give me, I will be very very confident of it. But once I realize that okay, the information that the machine is taking it may not be accurate. The output that I will get from the machine, I will be more. I will try to be more careful about interpreting that output. For example, in this case, if I would not know that my brain is prone to these kind of trickery. i will be very confident of my answer of let's say two triangles or eight triangles and anybody who's going to try to tell me there are zero triangles i will find it hard to believe so knowing how your brain is taking in information and how it can trick you will actually help you understand your behavior sometimes and then you may realize that there is you cannot uh, be 100% uh, uh, you, you cannot be 100% confident of the things that you believe in and this will have some this will introduce some flexibility in your behavior which we call cognitive flexibility yeah. and this may help you actually uh, sometimes adjust to the information that is being given to you okay. and in today's world this is very very important where you know that you are receiving a lot of information all the time especially with the internet boom uh, and to know how to use that information and to be aware that this information should not trick me into behaving in a certain way this will help you in that so okay. there's a lot of decision making actually a lot of things that you decide let's say i see uh, ma'am to give you uh, yeah yes ma'am no, no, about long term and short term memory ma'am yeah we will go to that yes we will go to that but here i'm just trying to yeah here i'm giving you some examples to make you aware that sometimes the world that you perceive is not actually the reality okay. it may be a bit uh, uh, uncomforting and it may uh, give a lot of people a bit of a uh, uncomfortable feeling but uh, just to make you aware that this may be may be the case so oh, that in future no. if you behave in a certain way or if you decide something you will be aware that why you are behaving maybe because of the inputs that you are receiving from the environment which may be different than what there is uh, actually out there so one okay. thing i know uh, it is like set by default in the brain and it's kind of creepy is seeing faces at places they aren't yes so the brain is by default set to see faces everywhere yes yes because from a very young age when we are born we see faces and faces are important for us to recognize so that we would know who is our parent who is our relative who is not who is a stranger so face processing is very important part of the brain because it helps us associate with people who are close to us so even in a random thing sometimes we can sometimes you remember in clouds we can see some faces some animals because this is something that the brain knows and it projects what it knows out in the world sometimes it's not seeing the world as it is which is the example here with the triangle but it is projecting what it knows on the world um, so go ahead just wanted to sorry i just wanted to check in if you want to move ahead with the presentation yes. and collect yes. questions after a while or yes. Yes. are you happy to let the questions roll whichever way I, you want to do it yeah yeah i know the kids are very curious but wait i have some more stuff for you okay tell me which uh, line is uh, tall or which one is short They're the same one. Okay. They're equal. They're equal. Yes, they're equal. Did equal. you guys do this already before? Yeah, uh, I did some uh, some some puzzle like this. I did. Okay. It's it's yes. just been blurred closer to the screen. Yes. Yeah. So here they are actually equal. Uh, for the others who don't know, if I put this bar, you may see it very well. But. Uh, why this happens that sometimes you may feel this one is the shorter line than this one is because of how these arrows are placed so these are arrows which are closing in so you feel this one is short whereas these are open uh, at the end so you feel these this one is long this is again a visual illusion now in the next one ah do you, do you know this uh, thing which broke the internet a couple yes. of years ago yes can you tell me what color do you see here please tell me Blue and black. I see okay. purple and gold. Ah, okay. <laughs> so maybe because of the lighting. Black. 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 I see gold and white. The lighting is different. Black and white. The lighting is tricking us. Yes, I see I both know. at the same time. That's very interesting because I have only seen this ever since it came on the internet as golden and white, 
and so i cannot see blue and black in any uh, condition so there are some people who said they see blue and black some people see other variants because of the lighting of the color blue and black yeah these are i think that the world and the information that we take from the world is very objective it is as it is and that's not the case that is just to make you realize Is there yes, no, is it what is the answer there is no correct answer here because uh, what you see is what is true for you right so for me i see it as a I see it as golden white for other people they see it in different color combination and that's what it is for you uh, uh, and so for this case there is no correct answer and a lot of people are actually still trying to study it depends on a lot of things it could be one is your uh, the the resolution of your screen and the other is the distribution of the the color cells in your eye so it can depend it can also depend on what is the distribution of the three like about the rods and cones in your yes, eye yes yes so depending on that you may see one color combination and not the other, other one okay now uh, just to take you one step ahead that do you know that sometimes it is possible for people who have lost a part of their body to feel pain in that body so in this case the arm uh the forearm is gone but people may go to the doctor and say that they feel pain in the part of the arm which has been removed phantom pain phantom yes, pain exactly. yes so th these kind of things can happen that your brain may feel that the body part which has gone uh, and you you feel sensations like touch you may feel that somebody is touching you there and you may feel pain sensation there and this is called phantom pain and we will discuss in class why this happens and we will go more details into this, this. because of the nerves i think uh -huh. yes. i guess this also happens when uh, sometimes when uh, our tooth breaks sometimes mm -hmm. we feel it's still there yes because the nerves are still there is so it the because brain... of the proprioceptor receptors uh yes yes it's because of the sensory nerves uh, that were there in that part but now they have been so the nerves are still there the nerve ending is still there after the part here the forearm is removed but the nerve endings that were going there will still be here so some people if you touch that kind of person here at the end of their elbow they may feel that you are touching the part which is gone because it's related to the nerve so the nerve which used to go to forearm is the in the brain it is still related to the forearm so the brain has not adjusted itself it still thinks that the information must be coming from the forearm even though the forearm is not there get used to something being there uh, one day uh, like, uh, like when a person's arm like gets amputated i think people like they sort of attach a wooden like arm back to it so when yes. that happens on the nerve uh, it connects it or it is broken uh so in in that case sometimes people do a lot of training with the rubber hand uh uh in in the, they come to the lab where there will be a fake hand that will be put in front of their uh, uh, arm which is not there and slowly and gradually you have to train the brain into believing that maybe the uh, the extra part that you attach is part of your body in some case or in some case to make them feel that the pain should not come from the part which has been lost so there are some uh, rehab training for these patients who report these kind of things they go to the lab and they are trained uh so slowly and gradually to believe that either the body part is gone so there is no need to feel that it is there or to incorporate the extra uh, limb uh, that has been synthetic uh, limb that has been attached like, yes like prosthetic limbs yes 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 some training is done for that okay now here i will ask you to tell me the color in which the word is written okay so first can you tell me what is the color here Red. Okay. Blue. Blue. Okay. Blue. Yes. We try to be fast, huh? Yellow. 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 Green. 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 Now you have to do the same thing. Red. 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 Blue. 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 Yes. Blue. 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 Yeah. Green. 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 Blue. Green. 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 Okay. Yellow. Yellow. Yes, it's called the stroop effect. Yes, but did you realize that from here to here you had some difficulty? 
here you were actually pretty fast and accurate but here uh, some people were also not accurate and you took some time to read it same can you tell me now again Ed. yellow yellow yellow, yellow. yellow. <laughs> yes you have to tell me the color not the word huh? green green red red blue green green who is green <laughs> yes Yes, so here what you are seeing is that your response can slow down or your information processing can slow down when there is a mismatch between what you see visually, uh, the which is the color and the language. So you see the word and you see the color and I'm telling you to report the color, but the word can sometimes create a conflict uh, and that can slow down your response. So we will have some uh, experiments. Ma'am, ma does it also depend on the question which is being asked? Yes, in this case, the question is mostly what color do you see? So I mean, yeah. But if the question is what um what word do you see, then could the reply be different? Like, is it possible that you tell the color instead? Yes, uh, in that case also the color may have a conflict. But in one case you may be a bit faster because you have to read, uh, which you may do faster. But people say vision is the fastest. Uh, in in this case, vision visual information will be faster than reading. But you will have conflict. It depend. Yes, but even if I ask you to read the word, there will be a conflict because of the color. I had done this as my science fair experiment in third grade. Okay, nice. So, yes, yeah, so we will do something like this in the in the class, and then we will also measure your reaction time. How long do you take to respond? There's this. Mom, does it depend on system one and system two of the brain? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Now we don't talk about the system one and two a lot, but it's yes. These are two systems that are actually in conflict with each other. So you behave fast when everything aligns, uh, when the information is aligned from different sensory modalities, but you slow down when there is when there is incongruency between the information that are coming from different system. And this is one example of that when it is incongruent, uh, what you see versus what you. Uh, there's this Please. research of some university, I don't remember exactly. So what they have done is they have written a paragraph with the f and all the words there. The first and the last letter of the word is same. Hmm. But the all the words in the middle, they are messed up and you can yes. still read it. Yes, exactly. Because you fill in what you know. For example, if I here, if I had made a mistake on the slide with, in some word, you would still be able to read it properly. Because you know this is how it should read. And these are all examples where your brain is projecting something back into the environment and making you feel that there is something even though there is not that thing, okay? Now, let's see how well your brain remembers. So this somebody was saying about memory and now here we are gonna just do a short-term memory test. So let me see if this works. Uh, okay. Yeah. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, yes. We can, we can you see only the... see the PowerPoint presentation. Go oh, no. Wait, no, I will change it then. So if you just change to sharing your whole screen instead of yes. yeah. just that window. Okay, so... Yes, uh, during the summer class, will we talk about how diseases affect the brain like autism? Uh, some diseases, yes, we will cover some because we we just have a few uh, weeks, so we are uh, we want to cover some basics about the brain, and then we will cover some functions that the brain does, and then at the end we will see some diseases. Not all because the time is too short, but some of the more popular ones we will cover in the class. Yes, so some neurological disorders and some uh, neuropsychological disorders. Yes, so here, this is the picture. I will give you 30 seconds to see it. Can you see the picture now on the screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now I will ask you, can you tell me how many did you see? Butterfly, computer, earth, butterfly, chair, guitar, telephone, clock, 
And then I will remove it, and then you have to tell me, recall it from your memory to tell me what you saw. Of course, when you will write it, and if you take a screenshot, it's not a, it's your your brain. You're using your brain too much, so you have to remember it. Force your brain to remember what you see on the screen, and then uh, you have to report. And some uh, based on these, so these are some tests that people do. Let's say if somebody is coming and reporting that I have forgetting problem, you can give them. Let's say in this example, you give them 19 things, and you can see how many do they remember, and that will become their score. That is their short term memory score. This is how much they can remember in a short amount of time. Okay, memory so skills now, are down after the exams. You guys had exams just now. After final exams, all the memory skills they go down. No, they don't. <laughs> It depends what you are learning. For people with, uh, for people with photographic memory, how does their memory work? Yeah, actually, they do what somebody did with a screenshot. So they can just see something, and they take in their brain, they take a snapshot of that, and they I remember it. That. Yes. Who has it? I have it, but I don't know how. Yeah. Uh, so for for you, in that case, what the brain does, it will just remember everything as it is. For some people, they may try to remember. Okay, there was a butterfly, and there was this. There was this in a spatial manner. So the butterfly was here, something was there, something was there. It's it depends how the eye is gazing in that scenario. For some people, they will just take everything as it is and remember it. So that will be the snapshot memory. Is there something in the chat that we should take up uh, before uh, moving ahead, Siddharth? <laughs> One moment, I was muted. Um, okay. No, not particularly. We can okay. go on. People have been answering the questions that you posed. Okay, okay. So now that I have, I think I hope I have convinced you enough that sometimes if somebody comes to you and tells you, "Ah, oh, this is what the reality is like," you can say, "No, no, no, that's your reality, not my reality," right? Because that's how their brain is processing information that may not be true. Sometimes we tend to conform to what a lot of people say. And this you will see when we go to behavior, things get very, very complicated. That if everybody is saying, okay, it's a blue apple, then even though I'm seeing a red apple, I will be forced to say a blue apple because I would think that if everybody is seeing that, I should be seeing that even though I'm not seeing that. Okay, so these are the things which will, if you start to realize it at an early stage, you, you will be more aware of, uh, of scenarios in which somebody may try to trick you or, or the output that your brain is giving you, you will not be basing your decision with 100% confidence on that. So this will allow you to have some cognitive flexibility in your decision making. Okay, so I will go back to the presentation and now we will see how, what happens if there's a damage, okay? So just slightly, somebody was talking about uh, diseases in the brain. Yeah, but I will. Okay, yes. So we will, of course, cover more in the class, but here just to give you some uh, examples, if there is damage to a part of the brain, what happens in that scenario? So, of course, the answer is it depends which part is damaged. So here it's an example of a patient who got actually very, very famous. He was studied widely. His name is a shortened version, HM. So this is the normal brain with a slice. Here you can see a structure known as hippocampus. This is very important for memory. Actually, the memory test that you did, a structure like this will be involved in that hippocampus. You have to remember something in your in your verbal content. Hippocampus is important. Now, HM, this patient had a epilepsy, and it was very very uh, debilitating for him. So he went to the doctor, and they realized that the epilepsy is originating in this part of the brain, and on both sides. And so these were removed. And at that time, they didn't know what hippocampus does. Uh, it was not known to the scientist. So they just removed it so that he will have relief in his epilepsy symptoms, which was the case. So he actually, the epilepsy was gone. Uh, he was fine. But what started to happen after that is that he was unable to form new memories. 
so the patient hm every time even the doctor will meet the patient the patient will ask who are you why am i here so he, the, the patient will not be able to form new memories even though the patient remembered a lot of stuff from his childhood and the family thing and every that was all known to him so the long term memory was preserved but the new memories were not being formed and that's when people realize that oh my god this structure that was removed was very important in forming new memories people say that hippocampus is also a chart for forming dreams is that true hippocampus in dream yes uh, i'm not aware if that is the literature but uh, in dream uh, we we don't know what uh, are the real structures that are involved but it's actually replaying so yes in what happens in hippocampus sometimes when you are resting that you can replay what you saw so the memory that you created during the day hippocampus can replay that sometimes that may become the content of your dream but that's not always true but what we know about hippocampus is that it replays the memory that you created during your wakeful hours why because then you will remember it better so this replay of memory it's like how if i replay a song again and again what will happen i will memorize it, it right? yes i will know it very well so if the the brain does the same thing sometimes you saw something in the day let's say you had a interesting class for your brain it was interesting so it it created a memory but when you were sleeping it started replaying it so that you will memorize it and you will remember it better so that is what I, it does sorry I, i have a question like relating right like right to this yes. so uh so new i'm assuming like neurodivergent people are like is can it be possible to induce uh like like can you is it possible to make someone neurodivergent simply by removing or altering like parts of their brain or is it usually something that a person is born with uh yeah it's an interesting question so in most cases uh, this is something that they are born with but then the environment can play uh, some important role so let's say what kind of exposures the child had during the early years and then in the adult life certain uh, chemicals uh, like psychedelics and all they can also have an impact uh, so what we used to know is that it's mostly the nature how you are born with can have uh, an impact but now we are now new research is showing that what kind of exposure you got during your childhood that will influence these kind of responses and then as an adult if you have some uh, uh, um, let's say some chances of having these uh, uh, um, the drugs then that can also have some impact but this this is a very very new research that is happening now we don't know much uh, but it has just recently been started uh, to look okay. at how the nature yeah, yeah the nurture the, the 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 growing up years and how your ex- the different kind of things that you are exposed to during your lifetime can have an impact on how your brain processes uh, this information yes. ma'am 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 Yes. Ma'am, what happens to mentally retarded child's brain, ma'am? Uh, well, can you say that again? What happens to a, a child who is mentally retarded? So, uh, what do you mean by mentally retarded? Um, a, a, a child with autism. Ah, uh, yes. Firstly, you can't say that they are retarded because they have a different uh, spectrum of behavior. So now in neuroscience, what we know is that nobody is normal. Okay, so and nobody is abnormal. So if nobody is normal, nobody is abnormal. What you have are these different traits in behavior. Uh, what you may say that a lot of people will exhibit what is known as a neurotypical behavior. Okay. Okay. And there are some people who will divert from that a little bit, but you cannot say that they are abnormal or they are retarded. All but humans are like neurodiverse. Okay, Everyone exactly. has differences in the brain. Yes, we are all okay. different. Yes, our behaviors are different, and then what you will see in them will be slightly a slight departure from uh, your behavior. Even within your behavior, it's not same every day, right? How you behave yeah. today may not be the same tomorrow. So even within your behavior, you are you are on a spectrum. Uh, you are you are changing depending on where you are let's say you are among your friends you behave differently you go meet yeah. strangers you have a lot of relatives at home you will behave differently right you are with your parents you behave differently so you adapt according to the context and this is how, how that's the that's the case for uh, different brains as well everybody's yeah. exhibiting a different type of behavior which is very very normal for them in that context 
which may not be normal for you but yes it's very okay. yeah it's everybody's normal in that okay. way can uh, like ma'am sometimes in our dreams can we see memories that are modified yeah. yes actually this is also exploited in a technique called hypnosis that you can you can tell people to think of something and then you can modify that memory for them so let's say somebody okay. had a very traumatic event early on in their life which is still affecting how they work now so they go to a hypno hypnosis person and that person will try to uh, with, with some technique which i'm not familiar with but uh, what i've heard is that you tell people to remember that and then you try to modify the content of that memory so that it is not as troublesome for you anymore okay yeah, so you can this can happen in sleep also uh, sometimes in in sleep you you may have some memories which may help you cope up with uh, some events that happen in your life ma'am yes uh, like uh, uh, how do ahead, we Nadia. get like how do we get who is asking this chapter uh, like what is the reason behind like getting this chapter which chapter uh, what's the reason behind getting distracted ah distracted so one could be that you have not slept well last night so if you have not rested well you will be distracted your brain just cannot focus right so you're saying why am i distracted means why am i not able to focus so one could be that you are tired your body is tired it wants to rest and you are trying to force itself to look at the screen right now maybe or to listen to my lecture which maybe the boy, you did not sleep well last night the other could be the content is not very interesting so your brain zones out it is interested in something else what should i have for dinner tonight shall i get this ice cream shall i get that what yes. are we going to do on the weekend yes so you may be distracted because the content is not very interesting for you and then in some situations where we have this uh, attention deficit uh, real attention deficit uh, yes where people find it very the they want something new all the time so they want some novelty uh, and uh, for, for in that scenario what happens is that after some time the stimulus is not very engaging for them so they want something new something new so they go on doing many many things so that they are excited and these kind of situations we are still trying to understand why it happens it may have to do a lot with how actually the child was brought up uh, in a in a young age and how they were exposed to in their growing years a lot of what your brain does actually is also heavily influenced by what happened to you after you were born because the brain starts to form the model of the world from the time you are born also actually before that but we have little information about it so how what happened when you were born what kind of environment you were placed in that will impact a lot of your brain functions so people who have had uh, let's say less attention uh, related things maybe they they were never given things which were interesting for them to begin with so they keep on seeking novelty so that they can engage with it but mostly it happens that you start from think you start thinking from point a and then you are at point z and yes. then you don't even some, remember it started yes. yes for some people who are let's say who uh, who have very creative mind they they tend to diverge very fast in their thinking pattern so they start with a b they branch very fast but oh. in, in the thing that they are interested in they will pay a lot of attention what happens now actually that we all let's say we go to school we are all forced i would say to sit through all the classes maybe we don't even like them uh, all the kids are there we are given same kind of exams or same kind of problems to solve so for some people it may not be interesting for some it may be uh, some may find music class very interesting so they will pay attention there they may not pay attention in the maths class so it's also what kind of content is given to you if you are really inter- interested in that then you will pay attention but if it is not interesting you will not pay attention ma'am also yes? like but also had a question Yes. If you get stressed, like the some say the there are some things that uh, help you like overcome or feel sad, satisfied yes. with like. Yes. Yes. So there is. Yes. You feel so, sad. So what we know is when do you like to do something is actually if your system finds it rewarding. okay so let's say you do something and i give you a reward after that for your brain this is very interesting because now the brain has linked this behavior with reward and it really cares about reward 
okay you would see that your brain actually is still i mean we say that we are humans very advanced but we are still very primitive in the way uh, the brain process information is very similar to other animals also so in animals you have seen right if you if there is a stray dog and if you start giving the stray dog food they become very loyal to you they will come to you every day outside your house wait for you because they want that reward now and they have learned that if, if if you tell them okay sit only then i will give you the biscuit they will start doing that they will start to sit even though they don't want to but they will sit because they will get the biscuit so you learn the brain learns the association that okay if i do x i get my reward y Isn't and if that how... yes that's why you study in the school because you get marks which are important for you so you study even sometimes you don't want to study you think okay maybe i should get i should study because i have good rewards my parents will be happy okay so let me study so it's a lot dependent on the reward that Ma'am. your brain drives out of it then you can okay. find it uh, engaging to do my question Ma'am. was in that like the yes. things that you like doing like satisfying you feel it satisfying and like you want to do it again and again Yes so then it is related to your interests let's say you are very very interested in drawing you intrinsically find it very motivating and rewarding to you and so then you would want you will like to do that so there are some things which are people say you no know, that try to find what you like one is that in india it may happen that a lot of times we are told what we should want with up from our parents from our relatives as we grow up we are told that okay this is what we should want in life so then i should pursue this pursue that but then there is something which intrinsically i find very interesting and then if i will do that i will find it motivating actually i will do it automatically because it is something i like that's my nature i'm drawn to that thing it could be music dance learning some language or uh, l- learning math science physics mom yes uh mom also mom what uh what Oh. Mom, what's yeah. the meaning of epilepsy, ma'am? Ah, yes, epilepsy is a condition in which, in some part of your brain, actually mostly close to the in the temporal uh, lobe, which is right above your ear here on both sides, you have a lot of uh, activity in the neurons, yes, which is uh, fits. Yes, so you you see people having fits, but what is happening actually in the brain is that the neurons are firing in sort of abnormal way. so we know that every time we will see in the class what happens in a neuron so neurons are known to conduct electrical information and to do that they fire what is known as action potential so it's like one shot of activity all the time in epilepsy you have zig 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 very fast in a very short amount of time you may have some activity which is not the normal rate of uh, neuronal firing and in that situation the person who has that uh, may experience what is known as fits so you may see some rigidity in the uh, in them this is actually very common a lot of people have it sometimes with medication this is solved but back in the day when people uh, there was not the medication and when people would have these fits or epileptic uh, episodes they would go to the doctor and they would just remove the part of the brain it would relieve the symptom but then what that brain was also doing would also be affected the function that that brain part was doing will also be affected. okay now because we have less time i will quickly bo- uh, back go back to the presentation so that we finish the stuff that we have and then if we have more questions i will come back oh yeah here it is so i gave you the example of hm then we have do you see my slide now yes ma'am okay now there is another problem uh, which may happen if you have a damage in what is known as the posterior parietal cortex let's say on the right side of your posterior parietal cortex which is actually if you just take your hand and put it on the top of your head you will reach posterior parietal cortex okay so if, on the right side if you have a damage and if you bring these kind of patients and you tell them okay this is a picture of a clock of a house and a flower draw it what they draw is actually this they will draw half of it you see here i have all the time point until 12 they have drawn only five and also not spaced it properly this half drawing of a house half drawing of a flower what this is that they are unable to pay attention to the other half of the world that they are seeing so this is known as hemi neglect hemi means half neglecting means neglecting so they neglect half right. of the world that they see in this case the damage is on the right so therefore they neglect the left 
because your body's with the brain it's a bit contralateral connections so you you ignore the it's not a vision problem it's not that they don't see it so here is where why it may get a bit tricky for you and we will cover more in the class for now it's just take it as it is that it's not a vision problem they see all the time points but when they are told to draw the attention is half they only pay attention to half of the stuff if you will tell them to correct the you'd like oh what about the other half then they will draw the other half but in the first instance they can only pay attention to half of the information that is presented to them is there any cure for that uh yes yes you you have to basically do corrective uh, therapy for them is it like but, uh, is it like similar to lazy eight and double doo doo what double doo doo no lazy eight and double doo doo what is double doo doo it's like where the left side and the right side of the brain are connected by drawing the same thing on the left side and the right side ah uh, you like mean the coordination ah uh, no 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 it's not a movement uh, no it's not a bilateral coordination problem it's just a uh, paying attention remember i had told you in the beginning of the class about parietal cortex that it's related to space how you represent space around the world so it, now it's not about moving into that space it's just paying attention to the space around you so in the first instance if you are seeing in front of you if you have a damage in the right posterior parietal cortex you would not see, pay attention to one half which in this case would be the left this is more common so that's why i put this example that if there's a right posterior parietal stroke in this part these patients will have neglect hemi neglect problems so they they neglect the left side but yes, we will talk on. more into details about how this happens so uh, if they if they have problem at the left they will they'll forget they'll not pay attention to the right side yes yes uh, if they have the damage yes to the left right but in this situation people have found at least that's what have been reported that uh, most patients have uh, the stroke in the right side so therefore this left hemi neglect is more commonly reported in patients okay but this can be sometimes dangerous let's say you are driving on the road and if you don't pay attention to the other side uh, so this may have some life threatening consequences so therefore understanding these kind of things and treat treating them is very important ma'am is there any treatments for that Uh, yes they have to come and do some therapy but if the brain damage is too much then there is not that you can do much it's just that now these people would need caretaker with them if they are trying to drive and go outside uh, and you, what you can do is you tell them to pay attention then you have to move all the time so that you bring the thing what is happening that let's say if you are looking in the front you have a left visual field and a right visual field okay so if i'm just looking at the front and if i don't move my head and if i have this problem i will ignore the left side but if i move my head then then i bring the left side into my right field right because i change my center again oh yes so sir. That, yeah so these people are initially not aware that they are doing this so first you have to make them aware that this is happening and once they are aware they can now keep on moving their head to bring things to the right side of the visual field but so that then it's a little uncomfortable yes it is i mean yes if you have a damage uh, to the brain things can become very uh, uncomfortable yes so overall the takeaway is that brain is very very fascinating and a lot of you were saying uh, uh, um, what's the point of knowing this is because once you know this you are aware of how your own system is working which is which is going to control everything that you do and we study this in is in a field which is called neuroscience now what exactly is neuroscience of course in a more technical way it is the study of your nervous system but in a more uh, general way you study a system which helps you see think perceive the world interact with the world uh, emotions how you feel and basically it makes you understand who you are because your brain is making you you and so if you have some understanding of neuroscience uh, and your brain you realize you you come to understand yourself better so your being you you come to understand better with kind of you're using the brain to you uh, understand the brain yes that's what everybody says that brain is very smart it is telling you that it is very smart by the way and then it is using itself to study itself so it's a bit of a loop uh, problem but that's what we got and that's what uh, yeah we have that that uh, conflict that the brain is using itself to study itself now and i hope some of you in future when you will uh, grow up and get out of school 
you will be interested in studying. Why? Because there are a lot of brain and nervous system related disorders. And these are increasing by each year, uh, which is putting a lot of burden on the health system. It, of course, affects your productivity. If you have a brain related problem, there is no way you can function the way you were functioning before that uh, uh, disorder. And just in India, there are, as of 2016, we know that 30 million people were affected. And these are just reported cases. So imagine people who are not even aware. Those numbers are not even reported. So every time you see a statistics of a disease, imagine that it is, of course, more than that. So these are just reported cases of 30 million people. And uh, some researchers have estimated that the cost can actually be quite high, depending on what problem you have. And therefore, understanding how the brain works in a normal condition, what happens if there's a damage, can help you treat a lot of things earlier. So let's say you study how memories are formed in a normal situation. You can use that knowledge to study the onset of Alzheimer's disease, which is a forgetting disease, which can help you save a lot of cost, which can help you save a lot of lives, and which can help you restore the productivity of the people who are suffering by that disease. Okay. Now, how do we study the brain? Uh, yes. I have a question. Yes. If uh, we are writing and we can't write with, like, why can't we write with the other hand? Mm, actually, we are uncomfortable with the other hand. That was my PhD uh, and uh, PhD research. So you can write with your left hand. What happens when we are growing up is that we are, people are called ambidextrous. Yes, yeah. a lot of people, actually, when you are born, you have a tendency to write with any hand, but typically your parents will give you the pen in the right arm because they were right-handed. And then you will start to write with the right arm. But if now you try to write with your left hand, even you put the pen in the mouth, if it is possible, and try to write something. You put the pen in between your toes and you try to write something, you will be able to write it. I will be able to understand what you write. It's just that you will be faster when you write with your right arm right hand okay and why because you have trained extensively so this is a result of training not because you can't write with other body parts it's because you have been trained to write with one hand and this sort of makes sense right in, in, the brain has a limited uh, capacity you have it's a small brain you have limited number of neurons you don't want to write with every part of your body so you dedicate one limb to do that thing so it's called compartmentalizing some activities. So the brain says, OK, maybe this part, you just use this. So you keep on training with one arm. You do better. But when, when it comes to writing, things like writing, you have a general idea. And actually, you will be able to write with any factor. So you can try with your left hand. You will just be slow. And the handwriting will not be that beautiful. But people will be able to understand what you were trying to write. So it's just a consequence of training. It's plasticity. So if you learn something repeatedly in one situation, you do better in that situation. The brain adapts with that. OK, so now quickly, how do we study the brain? So the first very, very easy and common way to study the brain is observe people's behavior. This is what we, we do a lot in, in the labs. Those who are studying human brain, a lot of us, we bring people to the lab, we give them some tests, and we study their behavior. So the output of your brain is behavior. So you just observe behavior, and which will give you some sense of what the brain may be doing. Okay, But then you want, if you are more interested in going deeper, then you have to use some techniques. Because human brain is inside the skull. You can't directly observe what's happening there. You have, and you, and you can't open it like in other animals. It is possible if you have the approval. But in human brain, you can't do that. So you have to use certain techniques which have been developed in the last few decades. One is uh, here. Uh, this is actually a photo from my lab here. So this is a sub person. She's learning a skill task on a tablet. While at the same time, we are trying to uh, identify the part of the brain which is helping her learn this kind of task. So if we use a set of machines, one is EMG to record the movements when she's doing the motor task. Here is a screen which is uh, trying to uh, identify the brain part. And this is a machine which is called TMS. It's more complex, but it's actually used to give a magnetic stimulation to certain parts of your brain. It's safe. So you can just put the machine on the head of the subject that you are interested in in the area that you want to study, and you induce a magnetic uh, pulse, which will actually cause the neurons to fire in the brain. And then you can see what happens after that. So you, this way, you can study different parts 
you can you have some control because you can target different parts of the brain using the machine and see what is the output if you target that brain area okay so this is one no. way the no, other is they, yes why why do we need to study their play, brain mom uh because if let's say somebody has uh, we by studying what remember the patient hm case so yes, the patient went to the doctor said i have epilepsy the doctor removed the part because the doctor did not know what the brain area does so now if we know what this brain does in a normal human being if we have a patient we know what to do okay right so th these are situations where you study in the normal situation so that you would have an understanding of how the system is working so that if you have a patient population you know what to do with them so does neuralink also like help to learn more about the human brain yes that was the goal actually uh, with neuralink but we at this moment we don't know how much to expect out of it but that's what their goal was that to take to encode all the brain activity that is happening and put it in a machine and then send it from the machine to the Translated brain and translate it across yeah and you can modulate the behavior with that so far we don't know how much success it's going to give us because there were some monkeys on which it was tried who died uh, so with humans oh, recently, yes oh i think recently uh, uh, the neuralink chip was inserted into a uh, volunteer's head and actually yes they are doing that but what happened to when they tried it with monkeys they died after a couple of months so it's a bit of an ethical question now that how they were able to go ahead with humans but if there are patients who are really really looking for some treatment they are at the stage where they are very hopeless they would uh, they would want to have that so we have we are yet to see the results of that and hopefully i mean the uh, the community will be very happy if it works but as i said the human brain is so complex that we don't even know what a lot of things are happening inside it so it's a big jump uh if we are able to achieve it it's going to be a very very big uh, scientific uh yeah discovery for this time then the next technique is eeg here people come you put some electrodes what they record is the brain activity so if they're doing a task you can see what is happening in their brain and epilepsy is also very good in detecting things like epilepsy so remember i said in epilepsy you have some abnormal firing of the neuronal uh, activity so if yeah. you put eeg you can see that how the activity in certain parts of patients with epilepsy is different from the normal situation epilepsy give you a very nice time related activity of your brain the other is mri so here you can just take a snapshot of your brain at a given time so here you know structural information with epilepsy you have time related information here with this technique you are trying to see what a brain area does by targeting it and then behavior is of course the output ultimately we all want to improve behavior and so these are different approaches that you can use to study the brain to impact the behavior okay because by behaving only you will interact with the world so you understand the brain and then you see how it impacts the behavior mm -hmm. now of course when human brain study started there was a lot of analogy with computer and we will talk about this in the class but because of the lack of time i will just leave you with that uh, do you think brain is like a computer or an algorithm and are there similarities or differences between analogy but i will leave you with this when you come in the summer i will ask you this question again yes in i can you go before uh, the no the other slide yes yeah this one in the in the girl going in the machine uh, i have been in that like uh, when i had an accident so like what does i don't understand like, how it will help the like i have had an accident on my like brain part so they i had i went in the i went in this machine like somewhat of like i don't know yes so you are saying that you went into this machine but you don't know why that was required yeah. yes so let's say if you have head injury you ca you cannot see from outside that there was some damage to the brain so therefore you have to go into a machine like this because what it will do is that it will scan the brain inside your skull and see if there was a blood clot because what happens when you get injured the most common thing that can happen to your brain is injury in the form of blood clot 
you hit somewhere you the blood vessels uh, the the impact on the skull was so high typically your skull is supposed to uh, preserve your brain from these kind of impacts but if you have a very high impact contact or accident in that case your brain may get damaged uh, through your skull also so you may have some fracture on the skull and in some cases even in the absence of skull fracture you may have damage in the brain where some blood vessels the impact was so strong that they ruptured and what will happen if they rupture the blood will leak in that area so the blood that was supposed to go to neurons to give them oxygen will just be lost outside the tissue you may have a clot which can give you a stroke stroke is the most common thing that can happen to your brain and what is stroke when the oxygen doesn't get to your neurons they need oxygen to function all the time if the blood supply is interrupted they don't get oxygen there is a stroke the neurons die okay and for you in in the nervous system that's why it's very very critical so that we intervene early once the neurons die it's it's almost impossible to recover them they are dead forever so therefore you want so what to is the yes so what, so what is the difference between a ct scan and an mri uh mri has more better resolution now so a lot of people do mri ct scan was the previous uh, technique that we we were using uh I th don't that think also that will also give you a good idea about uh, brain uh, the blood clot but with mri you will be more uh, certain about the area in which the blood clot happened so this has better spatial resolution yes mri is not just for the brain right mri is for any body part you can do mri for different body parts but it's very very common for the brain now so like i have been there because of my hand there's this ah, okay. there okay yeah hi Then everyone what happens with the bone i think yeah. we are reaching the t uh, end time and yeah. so then i have to quickly finish yes, but what is the function of the gyra and the sulci in the brain these are actually folds uh, so the sulcus is the fold the gyrus is what basically here in this picture if you want to see the yellow thing the light wherever you see light is the fold so it's a sulcus and the top is the gyra so this is just how your brain is arranged uh th there is no function of these they are just arrangement of your neural tissue so the of course it's big right if you spread it out it's going to be very big but if you have to fit it it's like how you fold your clothing there's no meaning for that it's just to make it compact and to yeah. uh, to put it inside your skull yes. so but um, most of the thing is happening in the in the uh, gyri because that's where the neural tissue is the folding is where the neurons go and inside Uh, and this is where they are exposed outside. Um, so, Goldie, if you're okay with going for another ten minutes, that's perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, yeah. wanted to. Uh, okay. Uh, so, I I just wanted to say that I'll uh, share a link in the chat of our okay. next upcoming event that is in three weeks. We are having a session on sports analytics. Okay. Um, which will be led by Dr. Ram Narsimhan, who is a principal data scientist at General uh, GE General Electric. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you're interested, I'm going to share a link in the chat. And otherwise, um, you don't have to leave now. Uh, Goldie's uh, kindly agreed to stay for another 10-15 minutes. And so we're uh, thank you all for coming today. This has been a really great session. And now back to I'll stop interrupting and let you get back to the great discussion you've all been having. <laughs> yes, I think uh, the kids are very very. Um, I really like this class. People are very very curious. and they are asking really good questions so i'm very happy now just to quickly end uh, this is in the line of why we should study the brain which is mostly related to your brain health you know it's very very important your body we all know body health is important and now we are in the era where we are recognizing how crucial is your brain health if your brain is not good your body is not going to function well now we know because everything that your body does is because of the brain so you have to take care of your brain in this we know a lot of things that can help you and i would really urge you to start doing it as early in your life as possible eat well rest very very well resting is very important number of studies also proving this grandma used to say sleep any problem just go sleep sleeping helps spend time outside in nature that's very important especially during day ha have some light uh, exercise in any form that you can Uh, start doing some relaxing technique like meditation and yoga this has been shown to affect brain and also the functions of the brain drastically so you perform better when your brain is better right so if you do these activities your brain is going to be in a good shape so the 
functions that it will do, like you paying attention, memorizing something, it's going to be good. Before exams, actually, you can try some of these things that will impact your performance. And lastly, which is very important, is to have a good social circle. So spending time with your family, with your friends, these are very important things for your brain. Your brain evolved in a setup where you are around your people. And so now, especially in today's time when we are mostly living just with our parents, uh, we, are, we don't have our grandparents mostly close to us and our relatives. Now it's even more important to have a nice social connection around us because it impacts our brain's uh, uh, ability to work. What is not good, you may know this, your parents have been saying this, is spending a lot of time on devices. Unfortunately, for this session, we have to be on a computer. But spending a lot of time on digital devices and on, on social media platforms has been shown now in new studies is not good for your brain. You get addicted to it. Uh, and it's a lot of information for your brain that it is not used to. There's a new thing through. called virtual autism that happens due to this. Yes, exactly. So a lot of studies are showing that it's not good. So if you can try to limit your time that you spend, of course, I know that for class purposes, everybody's moving to devices. But in your free time after class, try to be in nature outside, talk to people, have real face to face conversation and avoid doing it via the uh, via the screen is what I would say. So this is one aspect of knowing your brain helps you know what it does. And at the same time, it helps you take care of it better so that your body and your the functions of the brain are in good shape. And with that, I would like to end the class. Uh, I hope I was able to convince you that studying the brain is important. And the earlier you can start to do, it will be better. You would understand yourself and your behavior in a much, much better way. People will not be able to fool you, hopefully, uh, if you know yourself better. And uh, hopefully, I will see you in the summer. Class. Yes, yes. Um, ma'am, I have a doubt. So yes. basically, I'm nine years old, and for me, yoga kind of does the opposite of what it's meant to do. I get really restless. So, is yoga really something for kids as such? Uh, yes, actually, depends who is teaching you yoga. So, in yoga, what who, if they are telling you that you don't have to think? That's not correct. In yoga, there are certain physical activity that you do, right? It's oh, like oh, sorry, I didn't mean yoga. I meant meditation. Like ah, meditation. yes. So in meditation, if uh, the teacher has told you to not think, that's not the correct uh, approach. In meditation, you are just supposed to pay attention in this present moment. Right now, if you were paying attention to this class, you all meditated, okay? Because the real uh, goal of meditation is paying attention in the present moment. That's it. N it's not thoughtlessness. Maybe one day you will be able to achieve that. But in the beginning, your goal should be to be in this moment. Because what the brain does all the time, that when you're trying to meditate, it will think about the past, what I what I did in school, who, who taught to me like that in school yesterday. And okay, how am I going to do in the uh, future? How am I going to prepare for my school tomorrow, for my trip tomorrow, see my friends? So what it is doing all the time in the past, in the future, in the past, in the future. You want to stop that. You want to pay attention in the present moment. And meditation is the best way, tool that you can use to do. You pay, you force yourself to pay attention in the present moment. So what is happening now? So you can start also to put some music, which will help your brain pay attention to something which is happening now. It will prevent it from going from the past to future, past to future all the time. Okay. Um, but don't try to not think. That is not possible in the beginning. Okay. You just have to pay attention in the present moment. If you go out yes. and just observe people, that is also meditation. You just see people doing what they're Miss, doing. Miss, I have a, I have a question. Yes. Right. Uh, so, like I asked this earlier, but like, um, yeah, I'm just gonna read it, what I wrote earlier. To what extent do like external like injuries, like without necessarily penetrating into the skull, like affect brain function? So, I mean, other than like shifting the brain and its fluids, because I uh, had like gotten an injury a while ago, like mm -hmm. externally. So, yeah. I mean, so what are like the common like effects? Uh, so the most common effect uh, that I told you is that you will have the blood clot which can induce a stroke, uh, which will cause neurons death in that region. But the symptoms will depend on which, in which region this yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So I mean, so is it like, yeah. uh, is it like, okay, you're more at a higher or lower risk depending on where you got hit? Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Thanks. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, is there any new technology to like detect internal brain bleeding? Uh, internal brain bleeding. I think the the best we have is the MRI as of now. Yes. So you and have to one more question. Okay. Uh, how does the radioactive energy and like signals from our phone damage our neurons and brain cells? So for that, we haven't been able to find anything as of now. So we don't know if it damages the brain. What we know is that, of course, your brain has electrical activity. So the closest I think that we have gotten to know is that you should not put your phone in the pocket. You know, guys have the pocket here next to your heart. You should not put it there probably because heart also has electrical activity. Phone also has electrical activity, which may cause some uh, interference uh, with the heart activity. So we the closest that I am aware of is with okay. the heart. With the brain, typically people say that if you for now actually the phones are much more uh, uh, the 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 devices have a lot of things to to communicate with the Wi-Fi system, right? So they are receiving a lot of uh, input all the time. So typically when people sleep, they they are told not to put the phone next to their head, especially if it is on on Wi-Fi. Either you turn it off on the Wi-Fi and put it next to the table, but typically not very close to your uh, head. When it is receiving Wi-Fi, because the the electri the activity that it is producing now, the phones of today, they, it's very high because they are receiving inputs all the time from the Wi-Fi devices and Bluetooth. Mom. Yes, Mom. Um, like, Mom, if uh, if you have an injury, Mom, um, how will you know that it is bleeding and? Uh... So, if you have injury in the brain. Uh, uh, if it is a small injury, you may not know immediately. But if it's a big enough injury and if it causes a, a stroke there, uh, you, you will have what is known as paralysis. So let's say if it is in the cortical areas on the top, you will have some. You will be able to not move. But uh, that's the one that you see when it is a big damage to the brain. And typically for a small for a small clot, you may not see. And therefore, it's very important that if you have injury, you get this test done. If you have a small clot, slowly and slowly, it will start to spread and you will have slow, slow neuron death. Uh, I mean, so this you know, will come later. And what's, the, what's, the, Mom, yes? what's the, like, uh, what's the function of a neuron? The function of a neuron is actually very basic. It takes input and it sends in, uh, output. And it's just electrical and in nature. It's a, do they work like a team? Like they give connections to each yes. other? You know? Yes. They are, they're very, very synchronized. Therefore, now when we talk about a brain area, we talk about a network of neurons. Uh, they actually work. Uh, there's a saying, all neurons fire together, are wired together. So they work in a very synchronized manner. And your behavior is actually uh, an output of that synchronized activity. Yeah. So just one neuron firing on itself wouldn't be able to do much but they do work in a synchronized manner. That's how they communicate with each other about the information that they have received. Um, Goldie, there was one, I'll, let this be one final question. Okay. Um, uh, Ishan was asking, uh, how do migraines work? Actually, this is nice. I have migraine and we do not know uh, how this works. There are some triggers that people know that can uh, induce headache. Actually, we know very little about why uh, headaches happen. And it's my because of the air fluid, uh, of air fluid that drains through your ear. Yes. So actually, sometimes when you have low blood pressure, you may have low oxygen being delivered to your brain areas that may cause dizzy, headache, these kind of symptoms. So one is related to the fluid that is being sent to your brain. Uh, and sometimes you may have um, some very strong smell that may that may give you migraine so there are many many things but typically it's, it, it can be the symptoms can be reduced if you follow a nice lifestyle if you're well hydrated you may have less of that but the real uh, source of it we don't know why this actually happens but there are some factors that can contribute to it okay great thank you so much goldie oh, for I know so that, uh... generous um Sorry, Samanvita, we're going to wrap up now in the interest of time. Um, so we've reached 545. Um, so thank you so much, Goldie, for being so generous with your time and engaging with everyone. Uh, yes, this way. I'm happy. yes, I'm very, very happy. I'm really, really happy to have you here. And you guys are all very, very curious, which makes me very happy. Uh, I hope you like the session. 
and if you are interested <laughs> okay um, i have one final question yes um um how do concussions affect cognitive skills so concussion is linked to what exactly i said that if you have a damage in the in the head it the impact can be so strong that you can have blood uh, a clot inside your brain and then depending on which area it is let's say it's in the front i fell like this uh, or during sport concussions are very common during sport right when you hit somebody with your head and all so let's say if by chance it happens in the front and we know that in the front area you have a decision making capacity so it may affect your decision making it may affect your social behavior a lot of people who have damage in the front they become a social so just depending on where it happens it may have the effect on the cognitive function depending yes. on the brain area okay. that great okay Do so i I'm, i'm going to have to brain. cut it short sorry uh, yes because... like your questions in the summer you can ask me everything that you want <laughs> yeah you you can uh, you can contact us uh, at gifted yes, world and we can fo forward it there is something yeah. very pressing question you can send it to siddharth and i will answer it i'm i'm just going to drop uh, our email address uh, in the chat yes. uh, in case okay. you want to reach when out to us when do we get the answer for the cobra effect challenge because i already finished it um so we'll release that answer next saturday so every two weeks so once the challenge is done we'll do the next challenge uh, so uh, thank you all for uh, participating please do tell your friends we're going to continue uh -huh. through summer and have more programs happening so thank you all for coming today yes and uh, look forward to uh, please reach out on email or over the website if you'd like to and i wish you all a happy saturday evening and a good weekend ahead yes and oh, happy holy <laughs> have yeah, any repeats on science thank you ma'am Yes, please. Thank you. Mom, I'm willing to know no more. Yes, good. I will see you in summer then. I will ask you unlimited questions. Okay, okay. I am very, very looking, very much looking forward to that. Uh, and I really like you guys should always ask questions. So never keep it. Uh, Mom, uh, it is a stupid question. Yes. Mom, uh, do you have any?